What's up, everybody? Salam from Eight Gains, and I'm extremely excited to have Dr. Ramsey Nejem with me, who has a doctorate of science and human sports performance, and is the head strength and condition coach at the Sacramento Kings. So, Dr. Ramsey, thanks for doing this. Yes, sir. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Very cool. So, we've got a list of questions here, um, some general questions and questions that we pulled from the audience, and um, we're just going to go through them now. So, um, the first question is. Um, what are good general guidelines for increasing muscle and strength while improving athletic performance? Yeah, yeah, good question. That's probably one of my, the, the most common questions. And uh, oftentimes I think people think that there's this like give or take between gaining, you know, strength and size and giving up athletic performance. But uh, I certainly believe you can gain, get stronger, get bigger and become a better athlete as long as the balance of all those things are right. Uh, if you go into the weight room and you train six days a week and you have a body part split and uh, you kill yourself with volume and you're not playing sport, that's probably a recipe to get bigger but not become a better athlete. Mm -hmm. And yeah. vice versa, if you go into the squat rack and spend an hour working on your squat, bench, and deadlift um, and aren't playing sport or not worried about athletic movement, and that's probably a good way to get very strong but also lose athletic potential. So mm -hmm. when I start to think about how to balance those things and, and ultimately like gain – athleticism while getting stronger and bigger a few basic guidelines come to mind uh, you know ultimately it always whenever i get that question i always think okay how many times a week do you want to work out or how many times a week are you willing to put in mm -hmm. and so you know the first thing that comes to mind is if at the most basic level i would say you probably need at least three times a week whole body workout um, if you're willing to put in four times a week then i would just go body part split from there and i would do an upper lower upper lower split uh, those are probably like the, I think the top level, like split, you know, frequency type questions. Um, I would be a bigger fan of the four times per week, upper, lower, upper, lower split, because research would suggest that dosing with equated volume plus stimuli per week is better than one time per week if you have equal volume. So if you can take, for example, if you plan to do, um, you know, let's take something simple like your biceps. If you want your biceps to grow, and you're going to, you plan to put your biceps through 10 sets of 10 in a given week. Well, 10 sets of 10 in one session versus five sets of 10 in one session and then five sets of 10 in another session. The five sets of 10 is probably going to outperform the, you know, one session where you got 10 sets of 10. So if you can split your volumes in half, um, even equate a volume will be better when you split it into two doses. Um, and then obviously you get into the rep range talks and the intensities and, um, we talked, you know, before this interview started with about Dr. Brad Schoenfeld and some of his work and, and what his dissertation um, actually showed was that the whole rep range discussion is probably uh, is probably, you know, something that, that's fun to talk about on the Internet. But the reality is when it comes to application and results, it's probably not a huge difference in some of those loading parameters. Uh, mm -hmm. But obviously, if you spend a good amount of time, you know, I always tell people spend a good amount of time across the spectrum of um heavy, moderate, and light loads. And so, you know, your, your heavy loads of kind of one to five reps, your moderate loads of kind of that eight to 12 rep range, which is pretty common, uh, like quote unquote, bro science. Um, it probably has a good amount of validity to it. And then your upper ranges of like 15 plus training close to failure. Uh, so when I start to think about general guidelines for gaining size and athleticism, it's kind of like play your sport, do athletic movements, and then train, uh, with at least two two stimuli per week, even at equated volume, and then work across those spectrums. Okay, very cool. Okay, so very even cool. even at the professional level, um, you guys are aiming to train a muscle group two to three, or at least twice per week, um, with the variety of rep ranges, right? And strong yeah. and the strength sets, moderate sets, or sorry, moderate reps up even up to the high reps. So you guys using the whole spectrum of of rep ranges. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And, and then that changes a little bit when you get into kind of your periodization of off season versus in season, um, because those higher rep ranges, especially those moderate rep ranges of like eight to 12, that's probably the nice balance of uh, mechanical tension and muscle damage and muscle damage obviously leads to soreness. Um, so in season, we got to shy away from things that might stimulate soreness. Um, and so, you know, in the off season, we don't have to worry about it too much because if a guy is sore, it's not a huge deal. Mm -hmm. So in season, we'll stay away from some of those muscle damage type rep ranges of like eight to 12 reps. We'll spend more time at that lower end of like three to five reps, three to eight reps, and just try to make sure intensity stays high, but not induce too much muscle damage because we don't want too much soreness in season. But off season, 
we kind of do the whole spectrum. Uh, and, and then we build that over the off season, obviously. Very cool. So would Very you, cool. would you say, you know, during, um, the, the season where you don't want to have too much muscular damage. Um, so you stay in that little rep range really to maintain strength. Is that correct? And I guess you translate Absolutely. that strength into athletic performance through practice in the actual games. Yep. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, and most of our lifts, especially the, the lifts that we have at those higher intensities or your compound movements, you know, our squats, our hinges, um, our split squat variations, our hip thrust variations. And so, you know, we're spreading that intensity over multiple joints, typically with compound lifts. And then we're, you know, staying in that kind of three to eight rep range with intensity high because we want to maintain strength. And during an NBA season, there's 82 games. So there's so much that, um, you know, there's so much stress on their body that it's, it'd become easy for us to lose some strength if we're not staying true to true to the doses of high intensity movements and high intensity loads. The next question is, are there specific exercises that you find help athletic performance? Um, and it can be either help or hurt. Yeah, yeah. Good question. I don't know if like any movement actually hurts. Um, you know, again, I think it just always comes back to like the balance of sport activity. So if somebody for example, goes into a weight room and uses nothing but machines and is not playing sport at all. Um, you know, so if you're just doing leg extension and you're not playing basketball, that's probably not going to be the best way to create uh, strength that can transfer to sporting activity. But if you're doing a lot of sporting activity, so if, you, if you're playing ball consistently and often uh, or any sport for that matter, and then you're training in like machines, you know, these, these kind of non-transferable training modalities, um, you know, I think it's still going to transfer because ultimately force is force. And as long as you're getting the side of the spectrum where you're teaching your body how to actually apply that force in movement and sport, um, then I think you'll be fine. So I don't really think of like what's bad for athletic movement. I typically just try to stay on that other side of like, okay, what can probably help a little bit? And when we get into those discussions, I just think of movement categories. So for us, we want to squat. We want to hinge. We want to lunge, which is kind of our split squat variations. We want a hip thrust. Um, and now when I start to think about like sporting activities, right, like a hip thrust is more of that horizontal vector. So that might transfer more to like sprinting versus your squatting yeah. movement, which might transfer more to like your vertical jumping movement. Um, and then we pr we don't do a great deal of like the bicep, tricep, isolated type work in season. Um, you know, I always just think of what's probably going to help. And, and then that's when we get into those movement categories. And then from there, we also think like bilateral, unilateral. I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. You get into those discussions sometimes where people say, well, Sporting activities are unilateral in nature with running, cutting, and sprinting. So, therefore, you should do more unilateral work or single leg work, which I don't necessarily buy into. I think there's pros to, to both bilateral and unilateral. Mm -hmm. so we try to do a good amount of both of those things and balance those. Um, so, ultimately, I just think of how movement categories ultimately would transfer to the sport. And, and that's kind of how we, you know, dive into some of the movement to sports discussion. Very cool. Would you, would you say that um, some unilateral trainer – some unilateral training would prevent imbalances in strength. Um, have you guys noticed that to be helpful at all? Yeah, no, for sure. If, if there's an imbalance in strength or, high, or hypertrophy, um, then I think for sure attacking it with more unilateral work makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because once you have a bilateral stance, the body can go into preferred position. So if it wants to avoid a limb, then it can do that in a bilateral position, mm -hmm. whereas unilateral, it cannot do that. Uh, so for sure, in those cases where we have, you know, specific strength imbalances or hypertrophy imbalances or, um, you know, whether it's like force absorption or, or mechanical or coordination, you know, imbalances, all of those things, we want to attack in a more true unilateral fashion. But throughout the season and throughout the off season, we really dose kind of evenly throughout because the benefit of bilateral movements is you get you get higher absolute force production and higher absolute velocities. Mm. Uh, and there's benefit to those things. Uh, but there's also benefits to the unilateral stuff where we cannot compensate or use preferred strategies and we have to isolate, you know, positions and joint positions and, and um, muscles that have to, you know, basically be responsible for full force production rather than kind of altering to the other side. So, yeah, both have, have uh, implications, I think, for sport. All right. Very cool. I mean, one thing I've always wondered um, for vertical jumping, um, do you guys prefer like a front squat to a back squat? Or do you not notice much of a difference there? Yeah, I don't, I don't think when it comes to like a transfer of jumping, um, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. Um, I think that there's within individuals, one is one can probably be better than the other. For example, um, you know, front squat is going to require more 
ankle range of motion. So if someone doesn't have great ankle range of motion, then a front squat may or may not be a great exercise for those individuals. Mm -hmm. So when I think mm -hmm. of like front squat versus back squat, I don't necessarily think one is better than another for jumping, but I do think one might be better than some than another for an individual. Very cool. So, I mean, generally speaking, do you kind of look at, um, well, obviously not in complete isolation, but do you just look at strength training for the athlete sort of in its own way? Or like, let's just do what's most optimal to increase strength and, and hypertrophy um, with weight training and then focus on more athletic movements and practice and, and things like that on the court? Or are you always sort of thinking about these things in unison? Yeah, I, I think we, we always try to approach it in unison um, and ultimately think, like, how is this movement in the weight room going to help them perform on the basketball court? And if we can't answer that question, then the second layer question is, how is this movement in the weight room going to reduce a risk of injury or uh, address any kind of specific needs that they may have? And so as we go through those three layers of kind of exercise selection, ultimately program design um, determination, you know, if it's not answering one of those three levels of questions, then we're probably not doing it. Uh, but always in unison, because ultimately, uh, if you want to make somebody a power lifter, a weight lifter, then as they walk into the weight room, it's very easy to determine whether or not these things are going to help you. But in sport, it's this complex question of how does this squatting of a barbell help me perform on an NBA court? Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily know we have those answers, but we always try to bring it back to the performance level, because ultimately our players don't care about lifting weights. They care about basketball. And we have to keep that in mind. Cool. Very cool. So um, the, the next question is, what does a full training program for an NBA basketball player look like? Um, really, you know, can you give us some insights on, you know, how you guys manage so many things at the same time from weight training, um, drills, practice, games, recovery? It just seems like a lot of things to manage. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure it is. And it's one of the unique challenges of the NBA, which to me is why the NBA kind of performance realm or strength and conditioning realm is um, such an intriguing space for me because it's game congestion is crazy and it's variable. So it's not like, you know, in the NFL, you might play once a week and we know timeline of that. Well, in the NBA, on average, we play 3.4 times a week, which is basically every other day. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. last year we had three occasions where we had two days between games. Or excuse me, we had three games between days on three occasions. I think there was like 14 or so times where it was two days and every other time was just every other day. And so you're balancing an NBA schedule, which is 82 games in six months, basically every other day with trying to create some training regimen that's going to, you know, impose demands and stimuli and adaptation. Uh, so it, it basically controls chaos. And so I say all that to say that we have to remain very flexible in what we do. So um, we do write the programs um, at a monthly level and try to understand what's coming up, what's to come, what do these guys need? Uh, based on our assessments, let's address those things and let's try to reassess those things. But that top level A plan has to remain very flexible to uh, to minutes played, to uh, minutes changing, right? So your high minute rotation guys, for whatever reason, may change into the guys playing 35 minutes, for example. Um, and out of nowhere, he starts to play 14 minutes. Well, now our plan needs to change because the original plan was wrote with an appreciation of 35 minutes a game. And if so, for some reason that drops, well, maybe now we can add some volume or add some intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be very flexible to the changes at the game level. We have to be very flexible to changes at the travel level because there's travel and logistics that are unique challenges for us. Um, and so because, and then on top of all that, right, the daily symptomology as, as NBA players come down in our weight room and they present to us, we have to check in with them. We have to understand where are you at today because when we wrote that plan, hey, we didn't know where you would be at 17 days later, right, as you walk in. We have to also adjust to the daily presentation of the athlete. So we have to remain very flexible, but we still want to be true to our principles, right? We still want to probably avoid those muscle damage type rep ranges. We still want to, for example, um, induce some stimuli at a high intent level so we can maintain or even improve strength during season. We still want to attack your individual needs because – some guys still need to get bigger. And if we aren't trying to get bigger during season, well, that's six months of not trying to achieve a goal. So we still need to attack the individual performance needs, which are your strength and your um, hypertrophy needs. And then you also still have your kind of needs analysis on the injury prevention side. So you might have mobility needs or an injury history. And so we're trying to attack all of these things while also being cognizant of the schedule, cognizant of travel, cognizant of the daily presentation, and cognizant of just 
hey, the season over time beats you down. And some days, you know, a guy walks in, he's like, man, I ain't got it for you today. Mm. And so we have to make some determinations of, okay, do we push today or do we, or do we pull back? And so as you can probably imagine, that, that plan A becomes this very wavelength, uh, flexible schedule that's accommodating to the athlete daily. Very cool. That's amazing. Well, that's um, amazing. You, well, one thing you brought up was um, some guys, you, you're trying to get them bigger. And I know a lot of the, my audience is, is very focused on hypertrophy and building muscle. Um, yep. how, come, how come some NBA players, you see them, they come into the league and they gradually get bigger and more muscular over time? Where there's other yep. guys where it almost seems like they, they don't care. Like, you know, like Kevin Durant, for example, like he's been in the league yep. forever and he still looks like the long, lanky guy. Where there's other guys, they come in looking decent and now they're just like completely jacked. Um, yeah. Is, is there a reason for that? How come some guys are focused on getting bigger and other guys are just, they, they're not too, doesn't seem like they're too concerned? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my first, I mean, Kevin Durant's a good example. Uh, my kind of first, I think, answer to that would probably be it, it's very dependent on top level skill and so guys that are very very skilled especially early on in their career oftentimes don't i think feel a need to add a bunch of muscle mass because ultimately they're they're performing based at, based on a skill level whereas if you think of other guys um you know someone like Giannis comes to mind as he's grown and, and he's been a guy that's grown over the past few years um uh, He's bulked up pretty well. Mm -hmm. And part mm -hmm. of that is style of play, right? Like part of his game is kind of running into people, trying to dunk on people, being a little bit more physical. Mm -hmm. And that physicality mm -hmm. often comes as the balance to, I want, I don't want to say lack of skill, um, but certainly less skill than someone like Kevin Durant, right? And so like someone like Steph Curry, very skilled guy. Uh, and so I think it's just that balance of the more, you know, Kobe Bryant, for example, wasn't that, you know, big. It was big enough. Um, and lean enough and mean enough, but he wasn't this guy that came in and, and just kind of like got jacked like Dwight Howard. Uh, and I think it's that balance of like, if you're very skilled and adding that extra mass um, may or may not help you. And I think it's a, a determination that that individual player or that individual support staff has made. Uh, so I think it's kind of that balance and other guys who are less skilled that are just bruisers. Like, Hey, if you know your role is going to be kind of rebounding, or going to be setting screens, or going to be kind of fouling people and being kind of that anger, that that dog on the team. Mm -hmm. All of those lend well to like strength and conditioning, get in the weight room. Um, whereas if you're going to be a finesse guy running off screens, getting shots up, um, and then you got kind of your freaks. Like James Harden is actually pretty big. He's very skilled and very big, and his size helps. Uh, so I don't think it's a, it is an easy answer in there. Um, but what I always go to when I think of does a player need to get big is or bigger or stronger in our industry. You know, people always talk about, you know, is this guy strong enough? Is this guy big enough? And I think that's probably the wrong question. The right question should be, is this guy strong enough to guard the positions he needs to guard, to do the things offensively or tactically or technically that he needs to do? So if you have an offense that um, requires us to, to drive the paint and try to get layups and free throws, well, we probably want to put a little extra size on so we can take a bump in the lane and, and finish through contact. Um, if we have an offense like, um, the Houston Rockets where we're shooting 53s a game and we're not necessarily worried about kind of being the bruiser and slowing the game down. Well, maybe we're going to spend a whole bunch of time just getting jumpers and adding size isn't going to be this big emphasis at the team level. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, and then I think lastly to that, it, it all comes down to at the individual level, what has the player done before he got to the NBA, right? And so some of these young guys that get to us, they don't have a big training history and they haven't been in an environment where They've been exposed to, you know, caloric surplus. At the NBA level, there's calories everywhere. There's food everywhere. Um, and so if it's a guy who hasn't been in that environment, who hasn't been, in, uh, you know, uh, exposed to high-level training before and feels a need to get bigger, then that's a nice recipe for gaining size, obviously. Mm -hmm. oh, amazing. That's, that's actually fantastic insight. Um, like they're, you know, they're, they're getting bigger really depends on their role on the basketball court. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So one thing you mentioned earlier was, um, you typically for your resistance training, you stick to like a full body program or you do some sort of upper lower split, right? Um, can you sort of just go through like a full body example? Um, cause one, one thing I know a lot of guys, you know, watching this are going to, are going to be interested in is, you know, what sort of specific training are they doing? Um, at least in the weight room. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh... As players walk into our weight room, we're going to do something that's specific to them that is a warm-up for that day. And so we call that kind of like our prep package. We want to get you prepared for the lift for the day. Uh, 
And some of those exercises are, are warm up sets. You know, for example, we have a, a trap bar deadlift on the menu that day. Then we might be hitting some kettlebell deadlifts just to warm you up to that movement. Mm-hmm. Some of those exercises are specific to your injury risk. So, you know, if we, um, you know, if a guy, for example, has a history of ankle sprains and we know that he needs ankle uh, mobility or stability, then he's probably doing something for that. Um, if a guy has, uh, you know, a hamstring strain in the past, and we're probably doing something for the hamstring. So that kind of, as you walk in, we're going to start trying to knock out some of those things and get you ready for your work sets. If we go into our work blocks, and that's where we're going to get into kind of our whole body lift, quote unquote. Um, we look at squats and we look at hinges. It goes back to those movement categories. We're going to get our big, our big kind of lower for the day right in that first block of work because we want to knock it out when you're fresh. Um, and then we get into kind of like our work two block, and that's going to be uh, usually like a secondary hinge or a squat. We're going to get our uppers, and again, it's just pushes and pulls, so very easy movement categories. Is it a horizontal push, horizontal pull day? Is it, is it a vertical push, vertical pull day? And then we're getting some trunk in there, which is kind of like your abs, quote-unquote. We don't do a lot of flexion-based ab work. We do kind of that anti, quote-unquote, um, trunk work, so it, it could be kind of uh, you know, for the listeners, if you think of like a, a front plank or a side plank, so a side plank is going to be kind of that anti-lateral flexion. A front plank might be that anti-extension position. Uh, you know, a parallel press or anti. Uh, so our trunk work is going to reflect more of those qualities of trying to stiffen the trunk and, and resist movement. Uh, and then we might end the day with some arm farm or some shoulder work or just some like quote unquote hypertrophy work. Um, and that's just for guys who want to get bigger arms, right? Like. NBA guys are just like us, and sometimes they want to grab some dumbbells and go, you know, knock out a set of 30 while looking at themselves in the mirror. And, like, we're all for that, too, because I tell our guys, NBA, basketball in general is tank top season, right? Like, these guys are playing in tank top, so if we can get the pipes going, then we're all for that. So that's kind of what that whole body menu would look like. Okay, cool. Very nice. Uh, so what, what sort of recovery strategy have you guys found effective? Because, like you mentioned, these guys are pretty much training all the time. with gains every other day resistance training and some sort of practice in between. Um, what are like the most effective recovery um, strategies have you guys found? Yeah, yeah good question. Uh, and obviously recovery is a hot topic in, in the NBA. I mean, at the professional sporting level, um, in all sports it is, but especially the NBA because you play so many games. Um, so whenever I talk about recovery, I always go to like sleep and nutrition are first and foremost. Because mm-hmm. uh, no matter what other modality you bring in, whether it's compression, whether it's um, – contrast, whether it's cryo chambers, like all of massage, all of those things have a place and they have a, they certainly have value, but those are all secondary to a good sleep uh, protocol or habits, good sleep habits, and then nutrition. So whenever I think of recovery, I think, are we getting our eight to 10 hours of sleep that we should be getting? And are we getting the calories we need to achieve our goal? And now sometimes if a guy has a body, la- a body fat loss goal, well, we have to create a caloric deficit, obviously, um, but we don't want to do those things at the expense of recovery because ultimately it goes back to performance. We have to be able to perform to play because um, if you're not performing, then you're going to sit the bench and nobody's happy with that. So, you know, ultimately it's a, all right, let's check calories. Are we getting enough calories? Let's check the timing of those things. Are we feeding around our workout kind of regiments? Um, and then uh, let's look at our sleep habits and that's quality and quantity. Are we getting enough hours of sleep? And if so, let's dive into the quality of that. Are we waking up every night? Do we have sleep apnea? Are we falling asleep when we should? Do we have good sleep hygiene? All of those things. Um, hydration is part of the nutrition package, obviously. Like, are we hydrating enough? And I think if you knock out hydration, calories and sleep, then you're probably setting yourself up for a good recovery kind of program that you should be on. And then after all of those things, let's dive into are we getting our cold tubs to feel a little bit better? Are we getting our cryo chamber? We do have a cryo chamber. We have cold tub, hot tub. Uh, we have uh, massage. We have uh, a whole bunch of modalities that our athletic trainers can put you through. So we have, you know, an endless list of recovery. But again, like to me, it's check hydration, nutrition, and sleep. If you have those big rocks completed, then you're probably recovering pretty well. And if you're not, then ultimately it's probably let's look at how much work we're asking you to do. And maybe that's just too much. Maybe we have to back off. How do you guys – um, go about increasing speed and jump ability. That's that's the next question yeah. that we had. Like, do you have do you have specific movements, um, whether it be with the weights in the gym or any like special movements you guys use to increase like speed or, or jumping performance? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, we don't spend a great deal of time trying to make people faster because we're fortunate to work with some of the best athletes in the world. Um, and spending any amount on making someone faster, for example, or making them jump higher 
is always going to come at the expense of some of the other things. And so at the NBA level, um, usually addressing strength, size, and injury kind of risk mitigation things, those are always going to take precedent over getting a guy to jump higher because most of our guys already jump pretty damn high, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and if I make our players, you know, if I move you from a 38 inch to a 42 inch, like, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds good and I look like a cool strength coach, but that didn't help you perform. That's probably not leading to any more rebounds, any more blocks. Uh, and so that's just to say we don't spend a great deal of time on it. However, when we do spend time on it, when I think of sprinting first, it's can we clean up some of the mechanics uh, first and foremost? Can we add in some of our more horizontal vector type training, which is like a hip thrust or any movement where we're really driving a horizontal force production? Um, and then can we load a sprinted movement? So whether that's acceleration drills, we have, uh, we have a, a resisted harness that sits at the end of our turf. We can get guys in that and get them into some resisted running. Um, and so that's kind of, I think, like the, the way we approach speed. Now, jumping is, is similar, but obviously vertical vector. So um, when it comes to jumping higher, we can look at not only squatting and building strength in this full range of motion vertical pattern, but also like specific patterning. So we know that partials play a role or quarter squats play a role, and that transfers to jumping pretty well. Um, when we start to think about resisted jumping, we can do some banded jumps. We can even do assisted jumping where we have bands attached above you. You hold those bands and you jump. And now that's like an overspeed sprint, but for jumping, right, overspeed jumping. Um, and so that's kind of how we would attack, uh, attack that angle. Now, if you're a high-minute guy, we're probably not doing a lot of that stuff because you're jumping so much in sport. If you're a low-minute guy or, not, or a non-rotation guy, then we can dose some of those things in the weight room. Uh, but everything comes back to kind of managing the NBA schedule, the logistics and all of that. But so, yeah, when I think of sprinting and jumping, those are the things that come to mind and how we should, how we would and do attack them. Very cool. I actually, I actually like that answer a lot because before you jump into trying to do more in, in the training facilities, it's questioning what is um, the highest priority for getting this person to be better. Right. Because yeah. I think a lot of the questions that we even got from the audience, a lot of them were like, how do I get stronger? How do I get faster? How do I get more agile? But sometimes it's like, is that what you need to get better? Or is it just a better being more skilled at the actual sport itself? You know what right. I mean? Yep. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So the, the next question is, um, what sort of exercises or what do you guys do when you're dealing with knee injuries? Because, um, you know, knee injuries seem, seem to be very common for basketball players. Um, how do you guys usually work around that? And, and what do you do to either, you know, help rehab it or just work around it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, knee injury is such a, a broad category, and so we would attack that a few different ways based on, like, what type of knee injury it might be. Um, the more common, like, my knees just kind of hurt, and you'll get that a lot in basketball, obviously, and even the casual listener who goes out and plays basketball, like, their knees probably hurt a little bit after, especially as you age. Um, and so we attack it, one, by, you know, attacking the quads, and do you have strong lower body, specifically quads, um, which are going to work, you know, help for those knees? Isometrics certainly have a role, especially with either the pain reduction stuff or building the tendon health around that joint. Um, so we'll play around with some isometrics for sure, and that's part of the program. Um, and then ultimately, it just comes down to loading in, in a proper load progression. And so if someone's knees are hurting, it's probably indicative of them taking on loading spikes or too much basketball, for example, before they were prepared for that much. So, you know, a slow and steady progression into volume and into loads. Because uh, joints adapt, tissues adapt, connective tissue adapt, and we have to give those things time to adapt. And just like any good training program, you want to dose and response. And so we want to dose appropriately and we want to build that slowly. And so that way, by the time we get to high levels of basketball, high volumes of basketball, the knee was ready for those things. Um, and then when it comes to like specific injury stuff, you know, that's probably an hour long conversation in its own right. So that might be a little bit too long to get into, but every injury is going to have, um, you know, some specific things that you probably can do to help recover from that. And, um, like I said, that's probably too long to get into. So would you, would you say a stronger leg, um, you know, stronger quads, hamstrings, stronger calves, even, um, would make someone less susceptible to injury? Uh, I think at the top level, yes. Like at, at the very top level, being, having weak, anything is probably not good. Um, and most of that is going to be relative to body mass. Because in basketball, you have to move your body around. So having high relative strength is, is pretty important. Um, but it can't come at the expense of all the other things. So just so you can spend all day in the weight room getting stronger. But if you don't, for example, train at high velocities and high contraction velocities, then even a very strong hamstring, if it can't contract fast enough and produce force fast enough, 
that's when you get like the rate of force development stuff. Uh, then being very strong isn't very helpful. So you have to balance that with the RFDs type stuff or higher velocity contraction work. Um, so I think it's a balance, but top level answer is yeah. I mean, I think relative strength plays an important role um, for health for sure. Very cool. So would you would you say there's ever a time where too much strength or someone being too like muscular or too bulky, um, where that negatively affected their performance? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of one specifically, but I can see how it can, because ultimately, when I think of size, unless you're just like a, a bruiser, um, if someone like Shaq comes to mind, like Shaq created enough force with his muscles that having his extra kind of body fat on top of that actually helped him probably a little bit because he was just running into people right and so a bigger object that runs into people especially with force or momentum is going to hurt the defender um but mass and sport is typically only beneficial if it can if it can produce force so having extra mass is just fat like fat don't fly um that's what i was thinking so like having extra mass usually doesn't help unless it's very specific to the tactical or tactical approach that you take so um you know if you're a bruiser if you're a center um if you're big and your job is to set screens, well, being bit really big is important. And having extra fat on the body or extra just mass actually probably can help because it's just padding for you and it runs into, you know, you're hitting people. Um, the other side of that is you can become, uh, you can lose, I should say, you can lose performance uh, if you spend too much time focused on just size or strength. And there's a really cool study, I can't remember the author, but this was actually in surfing. And they spent a good deal of time making people stronger. And while they did get those athletes stronger, their surf sprint actually decreased over time. And uh, oftentimes I think that's that's because it came at the expense of training for other things. So, um, you know, being big and slow doesn't really help. But uh, if you can produce force and run into people and you can do it within your tactical and technical demands, like it probably makes sense. So I think there's a balance. But in general, I would say like, you probably don't want to have too much mass to where it's slowing you down, especially in basketball. Very cool. All right, great. So let's let's get in some questions from the audience. Um, so one guy was asking about like the American Ninja Warrior in the UK, and what, what he's asking is, um, how do I increase agility and balance while still maintaining strength? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that you have to. I think ultimately, if you want to maintain strength, you need to train for strength. Um, and so if you're going to spend a great deal of time training for agility and balance, um, that's fine, but it probably needs to just be added onto your current strength program rather than replacing it. If you replace your current strength program, then it's going to be hard to maintain the strength that you have. Um, so yeah, I think that your agility stuff needs to just be added on supplemental to your, to your strength program. Cause the strength program I'd imagine is, is going to be very helpful in American Ninja Warrior. I mean, that's a relative um, strength sport basically right and you're doing a whole bunch of crazy things and you have to move your body around and if you don't have the strength to do so that's going to be a problem so even if you have the agility like the it doesn't help if you're hanging on bars and trying to like do all the crazy things they do so um, i would say just add the agility stuff to your current strength program very cool so um any any the next question is do you have any tips for severe hyper um atrophy after an injury the biggest one I would say is you just have to address that. So that goes back to kind of our unilateral versus bilateral discussion earlier. Um, so my tip would be address it. So if you feel like a, a left quad or a left glute has atrophy because of an injury, then you probably should spend uh, some extra time working on those things. So I guess a tip would be uh, if you're going to do four sets of um, rear foot elevated split squats or lunges, well, maybe just do one extra set for that left side. Or if we're going to do three sets of hip thrust, maybe do two extra sets of just left leg hip thrust. And that's going to get into that left glute. So I would just add one to two sets. Um, and over time, I think that one to two sets every session can build up into a lot more volume and a lot more strength work, which ultimately should help with that atrophy. Very cool. No, I definitely appreciate that answer. I mean, even me as a coach and a trainer, um, you know, a lot of times you hear people complain about imbalances in strength. And I feel like, um, and this is beyond injury. This is from day to day of life. And, you know, we all favor one side or the other. So someone's right arm might be stronger than their left. Um, so I guess my question is, um, you know, with severe atrophy, it, you know, it, it, like you mentioned, an extra set, you know, just adding more volume, it would be a good idea. But with unilateral training in place 
for someone who has like a small imbalance, they just feel like my right arm or my right bicep is bigger than my left. Is just you know um, a little bit un unilateral training alone enough to sort of balance that out with equal sets, or does it sort of make sense to just throw in a set or two until to sort of speed up that um that equal strength? Yeah, I mean, good question. I think the the, the specific answer is going to be uh, very much based on individual response to training, obviously. Um, but at the top level, I would say adding extra sets probably helps because if if your right arm is bigger than your left arm and you do equal amounts of volume. Uh, to each arm then if we assume that both arms respond to training evenly or equally then that right arm will always be a little bit bigger so if it's 10 percent bigger uh, and over 10 weeks you decide to do three sets of bicep curls left and right well 10 weeks later they you know both left and right should have grown but one of them should still be 10 percent higher or uh, bigger so i would always add an extra set um and because the, the other the, the easiest way to do it is just to avoid, if my right arm is bigger, just stop doing right arm exercises and just do left arm. Well, now all you've done is created a, a more balanced muscle group because one just got smaller and nobody wants smaller muscles. So, uh, yeah, I would add extra sets. Very cool. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is, um, how much of your job is teaching psychological performance or coaching you know, athletes on a psychological level? Or do you have someone separately dedicated for that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a tough question to dive into. Um, I think, you know, I'll answer it from the strength coach perspective. Uh, I think the one of the most beneficial parts of a weight room or a strength and conditioning program are that kind of psychological side. Like you, you become more confident, you become more willing, for example, to take contact in the lane or even seat contact. And so if you think of like really good all-star type caliber players, they're oftentimes in the lane seeking contact, right? James Harden comes to mind. He shoots like 20 free throws a game because he's seeking contact. And uh, so a big part of what we try to drive in the weight room is that confidence. If you have the confidence and the grit to grind through a, a heavy set of, you know, three in your trap bar deadlift, um, then we try to get that to transfer into the mindset of like, hey, I, I know how to work in the weight room and I, and I know how to grind through something. And so now I'm in, I'm in the game and I'm seeking contact and I'm trying to bump you. And I'm trying to hit you and I want that to transfer. So that's kind of we, how we handle it. Um, obviously the psychological part of the game go into a million different places um so keeping it in my lane you know it, it's really just comes down to like hey i grind through some sets in here and, I'm, and that's going to transfer like i want contact i want to be a more fierce basketball player i want to get to the line i want to uh play more physical offensively and defensively and over time that actually gives you a reputation and guys begin to even referees begin to let you get away with some of that stuff because that's part of your game so we try to attack it, attack it that way yeah, no, I definitely love that answer. Um, so have, have you seen guys you sort of come in early season where maybe in the weight room they weren't really willing to grind through sets or they, they kind of felt they want to give up on a heavy, heavy set early in the season, but through strength training and, and you sort of pushing them to, you know, get a couple more reps in, you start to see them get tougher and stronger on the court later in the season. Like even mentally, I'm talking yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You, you can watch kind of attitude change, right? Guys who become... Guys would come in the league, especially your younger guys come in the league a little bit more timid. And uh, and because the weight room, there's no – it's not like a skill level competition, right? So even – no matter how good you may think you are, if you're going up against Kevin Durant, like, I got news. Like, he's probably scoring you, right? Like, that's one of the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the weight room, is, it, it's just you against gravity. Like, it's just you against the weights. And so um, you can watch guys who, who are a little bit more timid early in their career, early in the season – and through the course of six months, of, in our, in, whether it's in-season or over a year, in-season, off-season, guys' attitude begin to change. And their attitude, you see it in the weight room first because it's easy to act tough against weights. And then that transfers throughout the season or off-season into the game. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely see that attitude change. Very cool. That's amazing. Um, so that's pretty much all the questions we have from the audience. Um, I guess one, one last question that I have is because, and this is really coming from the angle of what you guys are doing in the off season is probably a lot, a lot closer to what my audience is going to be doing in the weight room, um, throughout the year. Um, you know, for the guys who are dedicated weightlifters. So what, what yep. is your weight training routine, um, say in the off season? Are you, are you training like five, six times a week? Um, like how, how are you guys sort of balancing that out with practice? Um, and obviously just trying to get better in the off season and, um, playing basketball, but I'm sure they can get away with a lot more training volume off season, right? 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you hit it on the head. We're, we're training more frequently, um, and we're doing more volume. So uh, intensities, tr we try not to change intensities too much because in season we need those high intensities to maintain strength like we talked about. Uh, but in season when a guy might be lifting uh, anywhere from two to four times, two to five times for certain people, um, off season becomes like four to six times for most people. Uh, and so, you know, for some guys, we're able to actually double up on frequency and that alone would double up volume. But then on top of that, we spend more time in the weight room. And so volume within a session also increases. So our weekly volumes increase, our within session volume increases. Um, and then we're able to dose more consistently because of those things. So that's probably the biggest change is just volume, whether it's weekly, monthly, volume load, however you want to look at volume. Um. Uh, all of that goes up in the off season. And then obviously it trickles down during in season or as we approach in season because basketball volume shoots up. And so that's just kind of the cross of basketball volume is high, then weight training volume has to be relatively low. And then the off season as basketball volume comes down, well then our weight training volume can go up. And that's, again, goes back to that wave. Typically, like how many sets are you guys using? Are you guys varying between three and five sets or do you guys ever use more or less than that um, through, through your weight training programs? Yeah, I mean, literally, it's, it could be one to like six, honestly, um, more consistently and more um, often. It's like that two to four um, off season, two to five, probably. Um, but I mean, there's times where we might have an arm farm and I, just, and I might just say, like, yo, go get 50 reps of bicep curls. I don't care how you get it. And so you might do a drop mm -hmm. set 50, uh, but more common than it's usually, you know, two rounds through kind of our prep package stuff and then three to five rounds through our bigger lifts in our, in our kind of get to work sections. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably, and then I can't think of any time where we would do more than that unless it's a real, if it's, if it's a teaching moment, like if we have a new player and we're going to teach how to, how we want you to trap bar deadlift, then we might actually get up above five sets in the six to eight rep sets. Um, but obviously load is super low and volume super low because we're just teaching. Um, so yeah. Very cool, man. Um, yo, doctor, so it, it, it's been 45 minutes almost. Um, I highly, highly appreciate your time and, and thank you so much for doing this. And um, any, where, where can the people find you? Yeah, good question, man. I always get to ask this question. I need to write this stuff down. I'm on Instagram. Um, it's dr.ramsey.nigem. Uh, and that's where I spend most of my time. I'm on Twitter. That's uh, at dr.ramseynigem. Uh, and those are the main two kind of places I, I spend time now, mainly Instagram. Um, so, uh, yeah, go, go check me out. Give me a follow and uh, shoot me a, shoot me a comment or something. I love chopping it up with people. For sure. So I'm going to link <laughs> everything to Dr. Ramsey in the comment section below, to his Instagram, to his Twitter. And um, definitely check him out, follow him because he's, you know, he, he's the man. Has strength and condition coach and, um, you know, working with the pros. So once again, Doc, um, yo, thank you so much for doing this. And, um, you know, have a good evening, man. Thank you. I appreciate it.